to Russian history with Dr. Brovkin and AP European history with Dr. Brovkin. I continue with a series of lectures on the Russian Revolution and Civil War, and this one is devoted to the white movement and to specifically the situation uh, under General Dinikin in the south of Russia. Uh, in the previous videos, I talked a lot about the battles of 1919, the political situation in 1919, and my focus was on the reasons for the success of General Dinikin in the summer of 1919. And as I showed in the preceding videos, the success of General Dinikin was largely due to uh, catastrophic policies of the Bolshevik regime, uh, which prepared the, the uprisings of peasants and and the um, Cossacks, especially Cossacks, who took side with the uh, of the whites and joined Dinikin in their offensive. But today's th attention is on the historical, you could say historical, extremely successful offensive of General Dinikin, and we'll try to assess what chance of success it was, and if it had been successful, what kind of regime would it have been uh, uh, and uh, what kind of Russia would there have been? Because he really had the chance of all the opponents of Bolshevism, he came closest to Moscow and to a serious opportunity to overthrow the Bolshevik regime by force of arms. So here's uh, what we are uh, in the beginning of the uh, offensive. Just to remind you, uh, General Dinikin succeeded General Kornilov uh, and uh, at the end of 1918, Karnilov was killed and the white volunteer army was composed of volunteers, of officers, and it was a small force locked in the small towns of North Caucasus. But it is uh, the events of spring 1919, especially decozakization, attacks on the peasants requisitioning, terror, ter terror, red terror of the Cheka, uh, that really set the stage for furious anti-Bolshevik rebellions that opened up the way. So, as I mentioned before, uh, in May, um, the uh, White Army joined the Cossacks, and in June they took over uh, south of Russia, Rostov-on-Don, and then moved on to Kiev, to, to Kharkov, and then by the end of the summer they reached Odessa and Kiev, and basically uh, then they moved north to, towards Voronezh and then Tsaritsyn, and then finally in October they reached Aryol uh, in the uh, center of Russia, being uh, really about 200 kilometers from Moscow. As soon as the whites would come in, the natural advantage was that markets would reopen uh, and peasants would be willing to sell, and there would be foodstuffs immediately available, uh, and then they would be uh, immediately, overnight, they would restore the local government, uh, which would be the Dumas or the Opravas or the Zemstvos, and the cadets and the socialists and the Tsars, they would reappear, political parties would appear, the experienced administrators, the educated classes would reappear, everything would reappear, and there would be church bell processions and church bells and singing of hymns and there would be praises to the liberators uh, of the white army they would march in Kharkov uh, and then they would in other cities in um, Poltava and, and Kiev uh, and it would be like a, a unbelievable resurgence of patriotism and uh, success so that, that's what we actually were seeing, and that is the situation, why they were extremely successful at first. The population, including workers, and of course peasants were, well, and especially Cossacks, were welcoming the white volunteer army, and that uh, triggered more and more successes. Uh, so as I said before, the population was, uh, attitudes were uh, welcoming including the workers, uh, especially those that were under the Menshevik and SR leadership, they thought that the Bolsheviks were, uh, you know, squeezing them really tight in uh, acting in their name, but not really doing much for the workers. Now, now I'd like to focus on the values and the views of the whites, of the Dinikin's volunteer army. Uh, and, and I try to be fair because uh, there's a lot of uh, 
after the collapse of the Soviet regime, there's a lot of a resurgence of popularity of the whites. And some of it is due. Uh, they were condemned during Soviet times as uh, traitors and uh, counter-revolutionaries and so forth. So uh, let's just be fair to, to the whites. They loved Russia. This is one of the most important things. They were volunteers. Nobody paid them anything. They, they basically felt that it was their duty to do whatever they can to save Mother Russia. So in that sense, they were very uh, patriotic. Uh, they were um, putting their lives on the line without any hope of anything. Um, they hated the socialists because they thought because of the socialists, they, uh, the scourge of Bolshevism conquered Russia. They hated the Bolsheviks. Uh, they hated all the committees and all the um, uh, you know, innovations and the requisitioning and the Cheka, and, and they just absolutely hated it. And, and this is why there was a certain cult of death uh, among the whites. There were just regiments. They would put the skulls on there. Uh, uniforms, they would fearlessly march against the red lines, thinking that nothing would take them because they would rather die for Mother Russia than succumb to the Bolsheviks. So they're very patriotic, very religious. Now, a lot of them were monarchists, but it would not be fair to say that all the whites were monarchists. In fact, uh, more seriously, you could see that the political spectrum of those whites that were with General Dinikin, they were the ones that were successors to uh, General Alexeyev, who actually forced Nicholas II to abdicate. So they were kind of pro-allied whites. They were seen by the Allies, by the British and the French, as their natural allies. The British and the French gave them a lot of stuff, tanks, ammunition, money, support, ships. So they, they really were pro-allied. Uh, against the communists, the Bolshevik regime, and in that sense, they were not so keen on restoring the monarchy. It would be wrong to say, because the monarchy was sort of associated with Alexandra and her German sympathies. So this was not forgotten, and in that sense, they were not for Nicholas, especially since Nicholas was killed. They were not going to restore monarchy. The regime that they were going to establish is pretty clear. It's going to be anti-communist military dictatorship. Now, um, one other thing that went really well for Dinikin is that he was extremely talented general. He was one of the probably the best that there was. And, you know, you could see by just looking at the map, starting out in the North Caucasus in uh, sort of February 1919, uh, by October, uh, the whole territory of Ukraine and southern Russia, all the way to the Volga, and all the way to Aryol, which is a huge territory, population is about 40 to 50 million people, which is a third of the entire population of Russia, uh, of Russian Empire. And, and in that sense, close to half of Russia proper uh, is what he conquered or liberated, whichever way you want to look at it. So this was a very, very serious challenge to the Bolsheviks. And the way he did it is because of his military skill. Uh, the whites were always fighting the red forces that were superior to them, and they were always winning. In a sense, it was communication, it was dedication, it was fearlessness, it was use of railroads. It was a very, very successful military operation just from the purely military point of view. What also helped a lot is that the situation in Russia proper was not that different from the situation in southern Russia and Ukraine, which means that there was a lot of discontent among the peasants, especially over Bolshevik policies of requisitioning and Cheka and the committees of the poor and destroying the Cossacks and establishing collective farms. They had enough of it. In fact, later on, I'll come back to the topic of peasant rebellions in the Bolshevik territory, and I will show you in the next videos what an incredible movement it was that I call the Greens. There were tens and tens and tens of thousands of uh, green detachments, some of them deserters, who were uh, doing anything they could to stop the Bolsheviks, ambush the Bolsheviks, prevent the Bolsheviks from taking grain and other goods from the countryside. So uh, from that point of view, the advance of Dinikin uh, was going into the areas that were already in rebellion against the Bolshevik regime, and that propelled the rebellion, uh, propelled the rebellion and propelled the advance of the whites even more. Uh, so from that point of view, the opponent was not 
in a good shape. Uh, on top of that, the Bolshevik economic policy of war communism was a total disaster. There was a loss-making enterprises, incompetent factory committees that ran enterprises, a lack of engineers, lack of any qualified personnel. It was a very strange regime uh, of revolutionaries in Moscow who were sending out detachments anywhere and who were trying to recruit anybody who was going to fight for them. It was a regime of Cheka gang and murderers and rapists uh, in the name of dictatorship or proletariat. Those who know the Bolshevik regime in 1919 would not say it had anything to do whatsoever with Marxism or with class dictatorship of the working class. It had nothing to do with any of those. It was really a regime of, of a bunch of intellectuals uh, who recruited any murderer they could find who would be willing to kill for them and enrich themselves. So this is pretty much why the white regime of General Dinikin was marching from victory to victory. Now, about the state regime, uh, it was a dictatorship, as I said, and the laws were not done in any parliament of sort. It was under the so-called special conference, a legislative institution. Uh, he, Dinikin promised to reconvene or convene a new constituent assembly, uh, and uh, the favorite expression of the whites was blood and iron, uh, which is kind of uh, mimicking uh, the expression of uh, uh, Bismarck, of Chancellor Bismarck. Uh, in Ariol, just uh, in, in early October, when uh, there was a British journalist who interviewed Dinikin and published his uh, interview later in the British press, he asked him what his political um, political ambitions were. And he said he was going to run for president of Russia. Uh, and he said if we, you know, he hoped that he would be elected, which is a very interesting detail. He hoped, he, he did not say, I'm going to seize power. Now, of course, it could have been a propaganda ploy to appeal to the British uh, viewers or readers. But, you know, I sort of want to... Uh, I, I'd like to believe that he meant what he said, uh, that uh, they were allies with the British and that a uh, constituent assembly would be restored uh, or convened and he would run for presidency. Uh, now, about the press, the, the sort of patriotic press uh, at that time, it was definitely against the socialists. And here's a, a newspaper, Great Russia, uh, and I quote from this uh, newspaper, let us not be afraid of words. To let the SRs come to power means to let the gang of Bolsheviks come through the back door. You know, this sort of reveals the political attitudes of the white officers and the army in terms of they absolutely detested all the socialists. And in that sense, it was just like Admiral Kolchak, who started his rule by overthrowing the socialist revolutionaries. Uh, for the whites, basically, all the socialists were bad. All of them were just one step away from the Bolsheviks. Now, they realized that they were not really murderers, that they were, you know, revolutionaries who, who were elected to the Constituent Assembly, and there was a big difference between them, but they preferred to dump them all together as socialists, and in that sense, uh, there was no difference for the whites. And, of course, if they had won, uh, they probably would have not, they probably would not have tolerated uh, any socialists in the regime that they would be established. It would have been a military dictatorship. Now, one other thing that is kind of important to mention, uh, which is on the negative side, is that there were Jewish pogroms uh, because the hatred of the socialists translated into the scapegoating of the Jews and um, uh, in the south of Russia and Ukraine, which is Yekaterina Slav and uh, uh, Nikolaev and, and many other cities uh, in the Odessa, uh, in the south Kiev, there were, there were a lot of Jewish pogroms. And that means that the Cossacks and the whites, they would just take their anger on the Jews and there would be a lot of murders and rapes and, and the kind of a free for all. And the British journalist asked the uh, Dinikin, what about the Jewish pogroms? And he said, you know, Russia is corrupt and the people are corrupt and they hate the Bolsheviks, deservedly so. And we try to stop it. We try to fight against it. But uh, that's the way the people are. And we can only put an end to it 
after law and order is restored, which is a very evasive, uh, evasive uh, answer. He basically didn't want to be blamed by uh, people in his own army for uh, being a kind of a cover for the Jews or being, you know, uh, sympathetic to the Jews. It was not a good thing to be sympathetic for the Jews, and therefore he kind of tried to have it both ways. To the jury, to the British journalists, he would say. Uh, we are trying to fight it. In reality, of course, he didn't. He didn't do anything at all to stop the pogroms. So in that sense, uh, you know, the promise of law and order was more like a promise rather than uh, a reality in the territory controlled by the whites. In any case, uh, let me just sum up. Uh, if Dinikin had been able to take Moscow, most likely uh, the Bolshevik regime would not have survived because he would have had the center of the city, especially since in November there was a serious offensive of his colleague General D y Udenich against Petrograd. And if Moscow had been taken at that time, and uh, Petrograd would have probably been taken too. And that way they would have controlled most of European Russia, only the Volga Basin. Uh, and in Siberia, Kolchak was still alive and still controlled uh, the railroads. So in, in that sense, it was a crucial moment. Uh, but then there was this uh, weather factor and the seasonal factor, which is that in October, uh, the mud begins to be uh, on the roads, and then in November, winter comes. So Dinikin had to do a very important decision. What do you do? Do you continue the offensive thinking that in a month or so before winter, you're going to get to Moscow? Or you stop, retrench, uh, build the defensive line, and wait for the next year's campaign. He made the decision to push it on uh, while, the, while it's going, to just keep on going while it's going. Now, as we uh, shall see, this was a serious mistake, uh, and that offensive collapsed, and with it uh, collapsed the Dinikins regime. But that we shall consider in great detail in our next video, the collapse of the uh, Dinikins regime. And on that, I will f finish now. Thank you very much. Don't forget to tell your friends to subscribe. Bye-bye. Uh,